Grace and peace to you. My name is Pastor Doug, and I am one of two pastors here at Emmanuel Community United Methodist Church in Menominee Falls, Wisconsin, and it is my privilege to welcome you to this online worship service. In just a moment, you will see on your screen a list of the folks who are helping out with today's service. We encourage you to take note of that as we gather together in this digital space. Music centers us as we prepare our hearts and minds for worship. Thank you for being here today. Please join me in the responsive call to worship. God's harvest has begun and the fruit is plentiful. The work will take all of us right here and right now. There is much that has to be done, so many challenges to overcome. With God's help, we will gather justice and hope for all people. Our opening hymn today is Hope for the, of the World.
us join together in the prayer of invocation. Almighty God, you scattered the seeds of life throughout creation. You nurture them with good things, helping them to bear fruit. The magnitude of your harvest is beyond anything we could ever imagine. And yet, when you call us to labor with you, to be co-creators of this thing you are doing in our midst, we turn away. We come up with reasons to avoid going to the fields, and we put off until tomorrow what we ought to be doing today. Forgive us, O oh God. Challenge us where we have become complacent. Open our eyes to the needs that are all around us, our ears to the cries for justice that echo in our streets. Give us what we need so that we can confront the places where we have fallen short and share in your work here and now. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Our scripture lesson today is from the Gospel of Matthew, from chapters 9 and 10. Jesus went through all the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom, and healing every disease and sickness. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them, because they were harassed and helpless, like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. Jesus called the twelve disciples to him and gave them authority to drive out impure spirits and to heal every disease and sickness. These are the names of the twelve disciples. First, Simon, who is called Peter, and his brother Andrew, James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John, Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas and Matthew, the tax collector, James, son of Alphaeus and Thaddeus, Simon, the zealot, and Judas Iscariot, who betrayed him. These twelve Jesus sent out with the following instructions. Do not go among the Gentiles or enter any town of the Samaritans. Go rather to the lost sheep of Israel. As you go, proclaim this message. The kingdom of heaven has come near. Heal the sick. Raise the dead. Cleanse those who have leprosy. Drive out demons. Freely you have received. Freely give. Hear what God's Spirit is saying to the church. Thanks be to God.
was 1787. Across the country, a great awakening was happening. Religious revivals led by fiery, charismatic preachers sprang up in towns, cities, and open fields, drawing huge crowds of people. They came because they were curious. They came because they could tell something was happening. They came because they wanted to experience the emotional high of God's spirit moving among them for themselves. Richard Allen was among those caught up in that great awakening. Born into slavery on February 14, 1760, Allen grew up in an environment which constantly reinforced that he was different, less than, subhuman. He lived and worked within this social framework for many years before he started to attend the meetings of a local Methodist society. There he taught himself to read and write, became a member, and began evangelizing on behalf of the movement. In time, he was even able to convince his master that holding slaves was sinful, and shortly afterward was allowed to buy his own freedom. Allen continued to grow in faith and in his ministry, and this did not escape the notice of his fellow society members who benefited greatly from his efforts. He was eventually recognized as a qualified preacher by the delegates of the Christmas Conference of 1784, which, incidentally, was the same conference that marked the beginning of the Methodist Church in North America. Despite this recognition, however, Allen was not given the same treatment or respect as white members. He was allowed to be present for the conference, but he could not vote. He was allowed to lead services, but only the early morning ones attended mostly by blacks. Two years later, Allen became a preacher at St. George's Methodist Episcopal Church in Philadelphia. Again, he was allowed to lead services, but only in the early morning and only for the majority black gatherings. Those black congregants, many of whom he himself had evangelized, were told they could only sit in a separate area partitioned off from the rest of the sanctuary below. They were not to be an integrated part of the gathered community. Which finally brings us to 1787. Richard Allen and fellow black preacher Absalom Jones had had enough of the treatment they and the other black congregants were getting. When they protested by gathering on the main floor of the sanctuary, however, they were asked to remove themselves to the designated seating area. Instead, the two Methodist preachers stood up and led the black members out of the church building, never to return. Our lesson this morning from the Gospel of Matthew records another great awakening that was happening among the people of ancient Palestine. The timing of Jesus' appearance was no accident. For years, influences large and small had been coming together. They had created the strange confluence of conditions in which many heard Jesus' message, experienced his ministry, and witnessed his miracles. People like the disciples, who may not have always understood what was happening, committed themselves to traveling with Jesus and learning from him. Their hearts were opened to new possibilities as they began to see the presence of God among them. Not everyone responded this way, though. For as many folks who welcomed Jesus and eagerly sought to be in his presence, there were those who scoffed at him and looked for ways to undermine his ministry. They challenged his teachings, asked questions meant to try and trip him up, to eliminate him as a threat to their power. These scholars, teachers, and authorities who should have been leading the community into the field were the ones holding back. And what's worse, is that they kept others from going as well. We see this rather clearly in the story of the man born blind found in John chapter 9. Jesus healed the man and restored his sight, but not long afterward, the man was hauled in front of the Pharisees and the other religious authorities. 
They questioned him at length about having his sight restored and did not believe that he had actually been born blind. When his parents confirmed that he really had been, the authorities were unwilling to believe that Jesus was the one who had restored his sight. And when the man refused to testify against Jesus, they drove him out of their presence rather than believe his testimony. The same thing happened over and over again throughout Jesus' ministry, and it continued after his death and resurrection as the disciples and others went about proclaiming the good news. No matter what the people said, no matter what they did, the authorities were unwilling to answer the call and to join the labor Jesus said would be happening in the fields. This past week, mourners came together in Houston for the funeral of George Floyd, the 46-year-old black man who was killed when a Minneapolis police officer knelt on his neck and back for 8 minutes and 46 seconds. Floyd's killing, along with the murders of Breonna Taylor and Ahmaud Arbery, sparked protests across the country and around the world. It is tempting for many of us to think of these as isolated incidents, to see them as unfortunate occurrences that just happened to coincide with one another. Even as we look for answers or for explanations as to what happened, we do so based on the assumption these people must have done something wrong to deserve what was done to them. Just as the religious leaders of Jesus' day looked for reasons why those who suffered deserved to suffer. We don't stop to consider how these killings are the latest in a long history of violence and oppression inflicted upon black people ever since the first African slave was brought to this country in 1619. We don't recognize how in the 400 years since there has been a broad, systemic effort to deny them equal rights, equal protections, and equal value. And a painful truth we all must contend with is that those oppressive systems have been justified and sanctified by the church. We see this as early as the formation of the Methodist Church in North America and the treatment of people like Richard Allen, who though he was recognized as a preacher, was denied full participation in the life of its congregations and its ministries. Within a few decades of his departure, the denomination itself split over the issue of slavery. And a large majority of Methodists, especially in the South, continued to use the scriptures and traditions of their faith to justify its existence. It would be nearly a hundred years before the two sides were reunited in the 1930s. And even then, racism and segregation would end up built into the foundation of that union, with the creation of the separate and definitely not equal central jurisdiction into which all black churches and all black members were assigned regardless of their geographical location. Methodists were not the only ones to struggle with this, of course. Other denominations went through similar divisions or saw similar behavior among their members. And we continue to live in the shadow of what our predecessors started, confronted with the consequences of patterns and systems we cannot escape on our own. Right now on news programs and in printed materials, there are church leaders and people of faith speaking out against cries for justice. Those who should be leading the community into the field to share in God's work are the ones holding us back and keeping people from answering the call. Jesus regularly stood up against those who abused and misled the people of faith. He always corrected misinformation called out harmful behavior, challenged false assumptions, and resisted the pressures to sanctify the powers and principalities of the world. Yet he also knew that his time on earth was limited and that he needed to teach the disciples how to carry on the ministry after he was gone. When Jesus sent the disciples out in this morning's passage, he did not send them to the towns of the Gentiles or of the Samaritans where they were likely to think of themselves as saviors or somehow better than those they were sent to minister with. 
Instead, he sent them to confront their own shortcomings, as well as those places where the people of their own faith were falling short. Go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel, Jesus instructed them. As you go, proclaim the good news. The kingdom of heaven has come near. This was not an easy task. Although they returned relatively unharmed from this particular assignment, their future in the ministry did not end so well. Every one of them was arrested, tortured, and executed by the state because of their witness to the faith. They were reviled by the religious leaders of their day and by those like Saul who considered themselves good and proper people of faith. Yet their willingness to stand up and speak God's truth to power, proclaim God's hope for all the people, made an impact, inspiring countless others to follow suit. Now more than ever, we are being called as people of faith to stand up and join with those already out there working in the fields. Protesting in the streets may not be your thing, and I get that. But there are many, many ways we can answer the call to share in God's harvest. We can listen to and amplify black voices, support black-owned businesses and offer our money, resources, and time, just like the churches who are providing hospitality and medical stations. We can also continue to support those ministries that serve with the people, especially those of black and other marginalized communities. Yet we must be careful. We are not being asked to bring the good news to those protesting in the streets or to those who've suffered generations of systemic oppression. They seem to have a pretty good understanding of it already. Instead, we're being challenged to take a long, hard look at ourselves and to confront our own shortcomings. We are being called to meet those in our own families, our circles of friends, our faith communities who need to hear God's truth that justice shall roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. So have the hard conversation. Correct misinformation online and in person. Call out harmful behavior, whether it is coming from a friend or a family member or someone else. Challenge the false assumptions that tell us some lives are worth less than others, that some people have less value than others. Write to your representatives and elected officials, or better yet, call them, and share with them your vision of a community where all are truly welcome. Proclaim the good news. The kingdom of heaven has come near. May it be so according to God's will. Amen. We now have opportunity to worship God with our gifts, our tithes, our offerings. We continue to offer ministry from this place uh, into the community and around the world. Your ongoing gifts to Emmanuel community make these ministries possible. And we encourage you uh, through the slide, if you are, uh, need to mail your offering or go online to uh, and subscribe for uh, internet offerings. Uh, if you're from another faith community, we invite you to give your gifts uh, to that community. Thank you for joining us today. We have a very special opportunity. And on behalf of the Staff Parish Relations, we'd like to recognize and celebrate our two departing pastors. Pastor Graham, after 40 years of faithful ministry, you're retiring. And Pastor Doug, you leave for a new appointment. This occasion in normal times would be bittersweet, but truly a time for happiness and congratulations. Of course, we have those feelings, but the challenges of COVID-19 make this also a very sad time. We want to be together, share stories and hugs and blessings person to person. We'll do our best during the farewell parade with the limitations that we must observe. First, Pastor Graham, we have been blessed by your leadership, your spirit, your guidance, and your call. You exemplify a man of God, and we are so grateful to have the time we've had with you here at Emmanuel Community. 
We grieve that we weren't able to share Easter with you as one of the last great liturgical celebrations of your ministry as we would have normally. However, as you say all the time, we do the best we can, and you did. You have been a contributor to the very end of your time here. Not a single moment where you were checked out or moved on. We also are grateful to Kathy, her involvement in our music program, her happy and friendly nature. Her contributions to our church community have been many and appreciated. Thank you both so much. We wish you Godspeed in your new life. Pastor Doug, we congratulate you on your ordination. It was a pleasure to hear the reports of your journey along the way to ordination. We have been blessed by your work with the youth, your ability to bring biblical connection and historical perspective of the church to small groups, and your work leading the media team. Your resourcefulness in so many areas has been greatly appreciated. We know that your new congregation in Portage will be blessed by your talents. A bright and promising future is ahead of you, and we look forward to your ordination ceremony when that is able to take place. We wish you all the very best. And now we have some gifts for both of you. First of all, Pastor Graham, on behalf of Staff Parish and the so-and-sos, and Judy Newman and Ginny Patterson, we have a special gift for you. And we would like you to open them so that the congregation can see what you're getting. It's a mask. <laughs> <laughs> now, we know you're not going to be napping in all of your retirement time. <laughs> but we wanted you to have warm memories of us. Thank you. And Kathy, oh. this is for you. You're welcome. Oh, I get one too. And no napping on your time <laughs> off either. <laughs> oh, and I do take naps. One a day. And this would be wonderful for them. Pastor Doug. Thank you so much. We're not done yet. Oh. <laughs> That, that will suit you, Doug. I look forward to wearing it after my wedding. Wonderful. And this is for both Kathy and Graham. And also this plant oh. is for Kathy and Graham for your new home. Yay, thank you. Um, Graham says your favorite color was blue. Yes. And we've got some herbs in there as well. Basil, some sage, and some rosemary and thyme. Thank so, you. thank you all very much. Oh, I'm sorry. Thank you. I'm glad you mentioned that. <laughs> and the congregation has put together a love offering for both of you. Pastor Graham, this is for you. And Pastor Doug, this is for you. Thank you so much. Thank you. We now have an opportunity to come before God in prayer. But before that, just a word of thanks to the congregation for their gifts to Kathy and myself and for to Pastor Doug. We are greatly blessed by your kindness. So now let us pray. Almighty and most gracious God, we take these moments to offer ourselves to you to thank you for your goodness and grace that has sustained us and kept us and enabled us even during this pandemic. We thank you that you have blessed us as your people, that as a congregation uh, we have not been able to gather, but we've continued to offer our worship and devotion. We have special blessing today on all who suffer, especially as a result of the COVID-19 virus. We look to you asking for grace uh, for a vaccine, uh, for healthcare professionals as they minister to the sick and the dying. And we pray for those who have lost loved ones. May they know the comfort and blessing of God. 
we also want to lift up before you those who grieve today, who suffer the tragedy of racism in our society. We are saddened by recent events, the loss of life, again and again. We come before you to support those who protest for a just resolution. We pray for the American people that at heart we have been exposed as racist in our culture. Grant us grace to journey forward, to be part of this movement towards justice and righteousness. Enable us to have hearts that are accepting of all, to embrace all with your love, and to be God's people to all. We pray for those in our community that experience hardship and trouble because of the coronavirus, those who have lost work, who are needing support and help financially, and also with employment. We look to you, gracious God, praying that you would enable us to be a, a community that shares in the support of others. We want to pray uh, for the leaders of our land as we deal with these difficult issues. We ask that through your goodness and grace that our hearts be open to what you desire for us and that we would demonstrate a peace with justice. May you grant us this grace. We pray for the church as we seek to be faithful to our calling. We ask that you would direct us that despite not being able to meet in person, that we would continue to be the people who share God's love around. Grant us your grace as we attempt to be faithful to Christ, to imitate him in every way possible. We offer our prayer to you today in the name of Jesus, our Lord and Savior. And we offer the prayer that he has taught to us. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. Our closing hymn in the faith we sing is number 2130, The Summons. And we will sing verses 1, 2, and 5. The words will be on the screen.
Friends, as we go into our week, we know that we do not go alone, but with the love of God, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the communion of the Holy Spirit, called out into the fields with those who are already laboring for justice and hope for all God's people. Go in peace. Amen.